out, okay? All righty, guys, welcome to chapter four. We are officially halfway through this for the state of Florida. Uh, so if you remember, make sure you're taking notes, make sure you are tuned in live. And if you were watching the replay of this, I encourage you that you make sure you go back and rewatch the other three chapters. We're gonna make sure that we get this thing running. This is again for the state of Florida, but most of these concepts are universal for every state. Today, we're going to be covering chapter four, retirement and other cons insurance concepts, okay? So we're going to be going into diving into investment and retirement accounts pretty heavy tonight. This is going to be some pretty deep stuff, but this, this chapter is not going to take us very long to get through. Uh, again, make sure you have your notepad ready to go. Terms that we need to know. Let's talk about this. Earned income. What is earned income, guys? Let's talk about that. Uh, earned income is money that you go to work for. If you have to go earn it personally through wages, salary, commissions, that is called earned income. If you guys heard me talk about annuities, I use the phrase called first in, first out, and then LIFO, last in, first out. So first in, first out is going to be based off of the principle under which it is assumed <laughs> that funds are paid to the policy owner first and will be paid out. That's so funny. I always got people people reaching out to me, ask to make some money. Let's go. Gross income. What is gross income? It's a person's income before taxes or other deductions. Perfect. So let's look at this way. Okay. Let's talk about LIFO, last in, first out. Principles applied to asset management and life insurance products under which it is assumed that funds paid into a policy's uh, to a policy's last will be paid out first. If you don't know what that means right now, it's okay. We're just going through definitions. Nonprofit organization. It's an organization that uses its surplus to fulfill a purpose instead of distributing its surplus to the owners or, or its members. Policy endowment, po maturity date. We talked about that in the whole life insurance. Po policy endowment at uh, age 100, it would mature. Let's talk about pre-tax contributions. Contributions that are made before federal or state tax are deducted. Give an example, your 401k plan at your job. All that money that is invested is pre-tax contributions. Rollovers is when you withdraw money from one qualified plan and placing it into another plan. When you leave your job and you have a retirement account, such as a 401k, it is best to roll that over into another investment account with a separate broker. Surrender, surrender. Where's your white flag? Surrender. Early termination and the policy by the policy owner, meaning you cancel it, you surrender the policy, you're done. Vesting, the right of the participant in a retirement plan to retain part or all of its benefits. So there is something called vesting requirements. I know when I had a corporate job, they had a five-year vesting requirement, meaning all the money that they were contributing to my account, I had to be there for five years to have 100% of the money. Tax deductible, a deduction of taxable income resulting in a lower tax liability. There are some retirement accounts that allow you to put money away for retirement and it will actually reduce your income on your for your taxes. What is taxable? Subject to taxation payable to the state or government. And then tax deferred, taxes on investments or gains such as interest or dividends are paid at a future date instead of the period in which they occurred tax in which appeared the uh, tax occurred what that means is this your 401k when you invest into it and it grows you don't pay taxes on it now you pay taxes upon withdrawal which is that retirement all right so let's get into the meat of this 
Tatiana, do me a favor. Have Josh send me his page, his flyer, and I'll send it to that lady. All right, so let's talk about this. A third-party ownership. Most insurance policies are written where insurance and policy owners are the same person. Remember, life insurance policies, the, the policy owner does not have to be the insured, but most of them are written that way. But if it ever comes into play where a person, let's give you an example, mom takes out a policy on the children, that is known as a third party ownership, right? So third party ownership is a legal term which identifies an individual that's not the insured, the owner of the contract. And remember the policy owner has all rights to the application. They can control everything about the benefits. So we kind of left off this last night on chapter three about life settlements. So the term life settlement refers to any financial transaction in which life insurance policies sell the life insurance policy to a third party in some form of compensation, right? So if we look at all the benefits of an insurance policy or a third party person, the person who benefits the most from these policies is always gonna be the beneficiary, always gonna be the policy owner takes out a policy on whoever to make sure that the beneficiary survives, right? But sometimes we enter what are called, I kind of talked about this yesterday, that if someone has a life-threatening illness, they have a terminal illness, you can sell your portion, you can sell your policy to a third party. So another third party ownership would be if you enter what is called a viatical settlement. Again, I'm going to touch bases on that a little bit later, hopefully in this chapter, that if someone is, God forbid, on their deathbed and they have six months or less to live, they're terminally ill based off of the doctor, you can get a portion, you can sell your policy to a third party company that they'll give you a smaller amount of your, your policy for, um, for whatever you want to use that money for. Uh, let's go through definitions. Again, this stuff is very simple, very black and white, but we'll read it. Because life settlements are not involved in the establishment of a new life insurance coverage, a life and settlement act defines the term they're they are not in conflict of a sale or original life insurance coverage, but in which accurately identifies the distinction in the life insurance settlement business. Some of the more important definitions are the term business of life insurance settlement it refers to any activity relating to soliciting or sale of a life insurance contract, okay? The term owner refers to the owner of a life insurance policy who seeks to enter that life and settlement contract. The insured is the person under the policy in which there's, that is considered for sale of the contract. So the insured has to be the one passing away. I don't know how that would work if there's a third party owner and the third the, the, the policy owner doesn't want to sell the policy to help the insured. I don't know how that would work. Again, the policy owner has all the, the rights there. Um, so life settlement contract establishes the terms under which the life settlement provider will pay compensation to the policy owner and a return of an assignment. You ladies remember what the word assignment meant last night? Come on. Assignment was transfer of ownership, okay? Your transfer of ownership assignment was, hey, I'm permanently selling my absolute assignment. That's the, that's the word to sell it to somebody else. Uh, life settlement broker is a person who, for compensation, solicits, negotiates. That would probably not be a life insurance agent. That's probably a, a different type of company. Life settlement provider is a person other than the owner who enters the life settlement contract with the owner. If you do not get all that the first time, go back and reread this. All right, let's talk about group life insurance. I want you to make a separate page for this. This can get very detailed, but we're going to keep this thing very simple, okay? Group life insurance. All that is, is insurance through the job, through the employer. 
when you get insurance through the job, the job is in control of all the benefits. They get to determine how much coverage you get. They determine, they determine everything. So when a life insurance, I'm sorry, when an employer buys life insurance, the premiums that they pay is a tax deduction for the business. So the reason they're willing to give you benefits, they said, okay, we'll make our employees feel really good because we give them insurance. But to them, all it is is a tax write-off for them. So it's a win-win situation. Now, the, the employer owns the master copy of the policy. I need you to write, make sure you write that. The, the employer owns a master copy of the policy. The employee receives a certificate of insurance. Now, life insurance through an employer cannot discriminate who gets covered and who does not. If they enroll during the open enrollment process. So during the open enrollment process, there's not any medical exam required, okay? So make sure you write that down. There's no medical exam during the open enrollment process. If you try to get insurance out of the open enrollment period, you are subject to getting um, a medical exam or asking medical questions, evidence of insurability. Now, remember, let's talk about the type of life insurance that actually goes through a group, a group policy. It's actually called annual renewable term insurance. You remember the word art from the first chapter or from the second chapter, we talked about annual renewable term. So the cost, if you've ever noticed your insurance actually goes up every year at your job. And it's not because prices got more expensive, it could be, but it's because you're one year older. They're automatically going to increase your coverage, I'm sorry, your premium by a little bit because you're older. Now, the cool thing about group insurance is that it's not based off of your health and they don't calculate your premiums based off of you only. They're gonna take a, um, there's an equation, hopefully we'll find it here, here in a second. Uh, so group life insurance differs from individual insurance because based on the characteristics and makeup, some of the characteristics and concerns to a group underwriter may be which? The purpose or nature of the group. So you might see on the exam, uh, can you establish, can you get group life insurance? For, or can you establish a company just for the ability to get uh, life insurance? The answer is no. You have to be in business for more than a reason just to get group insurance. The size of the group. So there's something called the law of large numbers. The larger number of people in a group, the more accurate the projection the future loss will experience. This is based off the law, law of large numbers. Turnover of the group. From the underwriting perspective, a group should have a steady turnover, younger and lower risk employees into the group and the lower high risk employees leave. They just said, hurry up, get in, get out, retire. We need these premiums lower. Um, the financial strength of the company. Because the group insurance is costly, to the administrator, to the minister, the underwriter should consider whether or not the group is in a financial resource to pay the premiums or whether or not it will be able to renew the coverage. So it is completely up to your job if they're going to keep your coverage, which, why is, which is why we say group insurance is just supplemental insurance. You never want to rely on that alone, okay? So when you are having group insurance and you're getting ready to leave the job, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily, you do have the option to convert it, okay? So that's called convertible privileges, write that down. Convertible privileges. So you can convert your policy to a new one without any, without any evidence of insurability. So you don't have to go in through any medical questions for that reason, 
we have up to 31 days to do that. You have up to 31 days to convert your policy. Now understand this though. If you convert your policy, the premiums are gonna be higher because you no longer have the employer paying part of the premiums. Does that make sense? Now, let's just see if it says what type of policy we have to convert it to. Other than the rules that apply to con uh, conversion involving the death or dis disability of insured termination, if the insured dies during the conversion period, death benefits equal to the maximum amount of the individual would have been issued, must be paid by the group policy. So if you die in between a period of time of you converting it, your, your family's still going to receive the money. Uh, if the master copy is terminated, whether every individual who has had a plan in the last five years will be allowed to convert their policy to an individual permanent policy. So when you convert, you're going to convert to a permanent policy. So make sure you write that down. When you convert from a group insurance policy, you convert to a whole life. It's not term. All right. Um, that's all you need to know about group life insurance, guys. Um, let's talk about this. Let's talk about contributory versus non-contributory. Okay, this is so this is actually part of group insurance. Uh, forgive me, guys. So the employer or group sponsor plan must pay all the premiums or share the premiums. When an employer pays all the premiums, this plan is called non-contributory. So right, non-contributory. And right, employer pays all the premiums. And it must require 100% eligible employees be included in the plan. So non-contributory, employer pays the plan, and 100% of participation of eligible employees must be included. Then the next one is where insurance company, I'm sorry, the employer, and the employee are going to both pay part of the premiums. That is called contributory. So contributory, right, employee and employer share some of the cost for the premium. Right? Yeah, share some of the cost. And that will require 75% of the employees be eligible for the plan. Those are easy questions to get right on the exam. Non-contributory, employer pays everything, it's 100% involved. Contributory, employee and employer share, and 75% uh, must be involved. Okay, now let's go to a whole separate page. We're going to cover retirement accounts. We're going to cover qualified versus non-qualified. The definition of qualified accounts is that they are approved by the IRS. I want you to write this down. These are very important terminology you need to know. All right, so qualified plans, they're approved by the IRS. They cannot discriminate. They have tax benefits or tax privileges, however it's gonna be on here. There is a 10% tax penalty if you pull out before 59 and a half. So there's a 10% tax penalty if you pull out of any qualified account before 59 and a half. Now, when it comes to qualified accounts, the money is either going to be taxed, the money is either going to grow tax deferred or tax-free. So you're gonna put in qualified account, money grows tax-deferred or tax-free. And we just need to get you a good understanding of what this is. So when we first run into this, we'll be good. All right. So, 
this is actually something good we should we should actually write i'm, I'm gonna let y'all copy this chart right here this is actually a big deal right here because this this will give you the outline of how most accounts are going to work so just for, as you're writing it so you have something to listen to qualified accounts contributions are currently tax deductible so if you have a 401k and you put money into that account that is counted off your income plans approved by the irs so they're approved by the irs like i said they cannot discriminate earnings grow tax deferred and all withdrawals are taxed or are, are taxed, meaning anytime you pull money out, it's going to be taxed. You have your not your non qualified accounts. These are going to be your accounts that you're putting money in. It's still invested in the market. It just doesn't protect you from taxes. So contributions are not tax deductible. The plans do not need to be approved by the IRS. Your company can say, hey, we only want to give these retirement accounts, such as profit sharings, only to the executives. So they can discriminate. Earnings grow tax deferred. So again, they do grow tax deferred over here. And excess over cost basis, which means if you put in over such an amount, if you put in over a, an amount, it's going to be taxed. And you ladies, let me know when I can move on. Do not feel rushed. Take your time. Ooh, this one I should have Jeopardy music queen. Maybe that's distracting. I don't know. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's a good little break in between while people are listening to the, to the rewatch of this. Okay. We're, am I good to move on? I'm good. Gotta ask Kelly. Oh, and Jade. Say that again. I'm good on my side. You gotta ask the other ladies. You're good. Okay. Well, well Jade is still writing. It's fine. We'll take our time. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay, I'm good. No, no, take your time. Okay. Let's talk about IRAs. So the first retirement account we're going to talk about, individual retirement accounts, IRA. So there's two type of retirement IRAs. The only way you can contribute to a Roth, to any IRA is it must be through earned income. So under IRA, must be contributed through earned income, which again is money that you have earned yourself personally through a job or through your business, but it must be earned income. So under IRA, there is a contribution limit. We're gonna. I, I want you. I want you to keep this together. Let me find the contribution limit because uh, it could have changed on here. It used to be five thousand. Sorry, six. Mister Bielbanyo. Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so contribution limits at sixty five hundred. So for any for a traditional and Roth IRA, the contributions for anyone lower than six thousand, I'm sorry, lower than fifty, is sixty five hundred a year. And the reason I had to double check that is because within the last year it changed. So contributions are. For anyone less than 50, it's 6,500. If after 50, you can make additional contribution, that's called the catch up contribution. So if you're after 50, that is called 
That is called the catch-up period. And obviously, if you're married, you can put in excess of a certain amount. It, the amount that you're limited to is 6,500 per person. Um, and there is an income limit you have to make. Like once you make a certain amount of money, you can't, you don't qualify for these accounts. Um, but we're not there yet. So tax. So when you put into a, a, a traditional IRA, the money is tax deductible. So you can write this off. You can make tax deductible contributions regardless of your age. You good? Okay. So the fancy thing about, about these traditionals, you're gonna see this, where is that? So starting at 59 and a half, the owner must withdraw assets without having to pay an additional 10%. So after 59 and a half, you're good. However, the owner must start receiving distributions at the age of 73. So that's good. That, 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 that used to be more than that. So effective as of January 1st, 2023, the penalty went from 72 to 73. They used to. If you didn't pull your money out before 70, they would penalize your account by half, half of your money. So if you had 100 grand in there, they're, the government's taking 50%. But it is now 25%. So I need you to write down traditional IRA, minimum required minimum distribution is at 73, or they'll penalize you 25% of your account. Can you repeat that? Yes, the required minimum distribution is that is by the age of 73, if you haven't started taking distributions or withdrawals, they're gonna penalize your account 25%. That is traditional IRAs. All right, are we good on that? Yes. Now we're gonna talk about Roth IRAs. So Roth IRAs are very special, okay? They have the exact, I'm gonna give it to you. The Roth IRAs almost work identical to the, to the IRA, except you, there is no minimum required distribution. You can still put in 6,500 a year. The money grows tax-free, not tax-deferred, which is better. So whatever your account grows into, my, uh, minus whatever you contributed to it, any interest that you earn is all tax-free growth. As long as the account is at least five years old. So make sure you write that down. No, there's no minimum distribution requirement. Yes, the money grows tax free. Again, you must contribute to this account through earned income. It is still, if you pull out before 59 and a half, there's still a 10% tax penalty. I just want to spend a little bit of time under, helping you guys understand that, okay? So know this, contributions to a traditional IRA are pre-tax dollars, which are tax deductible. So a traditional IRA, you can conduct can deduct some of your income. But since contributions to a Roth are tax-free dollars, you can't deduct that. So right on your Roth, not tax deductible. So traditional, they are tax deductible. On a Roth, they are not. All right. So let's talk about taxations. 
The following taxation applies to contributions to a traditional. Tax deductions, tax deductible contributions for the year or based off the person's income. Contributions must be made in cash in order to be tax deductible. The term cash includes any form of money, such as check, money order, um, stuff like that. Now, it talked about the excess contribution. So, you know, I said if you put in more than 6,500 in uh, excess amounts, you're going to be ten, you're going to be taxed six percent per year. So write that down. There's an excess contribution. Excess contributions are taxed at six percent per year. Any questions on this so far? No? Okay. So let's talk about the distributions. So distributions from an IRA become income taxation the year that they're withdrawn. In cases, early distributions, again, you're going to get hit with a 10% tax penalty. But let's just say you hit 59 years old, 59 and a half. And you say, okay, listen, I put in a hundred grand into this account. It is now worth 300,000. So it grew by 200 grand. The moment you start taking money out of that account, it is going to be taxed based off of whatever your income tax bracket is at that time. So no more tax penalty, but you're going to pay taxes on that upon the withdrawal, of whatever you're taking. Uh, now, there are exceptions to where you can use some of this money from your IRA in your early years where you don't where you, and you're not going to be penalized. You want to write these down. These are the exceptions. So you can actually use money from an IRA as a down payment for a home. So it cannot exceed more than 10,000. And it's usually only for first time home buyers. So if you are buying a house and you have an IRA now, you can take generally up to 10,000 and use that for your down payment and not pay the 10% tax penalty. You will still pay taxes on any growth though. That's the, you're not getting away from taxes. Withdrawals for post secondary expenses. So if you said, hey, I wanna go back and get my, my master's, you can use some of this for your expenses. And then withdrawals for cash catastrophic medical expenses or upon, or upon death. I don't know what definition is catastrophic. I mean, obviously, I assume it's pretty bad. But for those examples, you can pull out of that account. So that's all for traditional. The following rules apply for Roth. Contributions are not tax deduction and excess contributions are subject to a 6% 6 tax penalty every year. All right. Y'all still writing or can I, am I afraid to move on? I was still writing the last. Okay, okay. Don't, don't let me move too fast. <laughs> I know I'm taking a while on IRAs, but I, I just want to make sure that we have a really good understanding of this, because this is part of an exam that you should get all these right, because they're so easy. It's, it's nothing, nothing too expansive. It's just basic memorization and basic understanding of how retirement accounts work. And then these were only for the distribution. Oh, it's not good. What'd you make it? I'm good. 
All right, perfect, good. So moving on to the next part, we're gonna talk about rollovers or transfers, okay? Again, I'm gonna keep this very simple. Rolling over an account, money. When you leave a job, so let's just say again, I'm gonna use 401ks. If you leave a job, you must roll that account over to a new one almost immediately if you have if you if you call the company and you say hey listen i want to do a rollover send the check to my house and we're going to roll it over into this account the moment you ask for the money you have 60 days to to deposit that otherwise they're going to withhold 20% of your money and they're going to withhold the other 10% for taxes. So if you have $1,000 in an account for easy mouth, they're taking $300 right off the bat just for, just for penalties and taxes. So you must roll that over into another qualified account. So when you roll your money over from one account to the next, there's no tax, there's no withdrawal. So there's no taxes owed, okay? Anybody ever heard anybody they have a 401k plan and they didn't roll it over, but they cashed it out? So, and they said, man, they, they, they took a lot of my money. If you've ever heard that, that's because they got hit with almost, they got hit with 30% in fees and, and, uh, and, and taxes. They withheld 20% and then they got hit with the 10% tax penalty for whatever the growth was. So, okay, so that's rollovers. It must be a direct rollover. It can't, uh, I mean, you can go to your bank or you can go work with another financial institution, but the money must go from their name with your name on it to, directly to that account. It can't be, hey, make me a check out to, to Ellie and then you go deposit oh, that, that you know, money in your checking account. At that percent, now you're, you're gonna get hit with some taxes on that. Okay, the term transfer or direct transfer refers to tax-free transfers from one retirement account program to another. Just said that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometimes I don't read. I just, uh, I just speak. Okay. I want you to create a line and I want you to write qualified plans. I want you to write qualified plans and I'm gonna give you every qualified plan you need to know and every little thing about the plan you need to know, okay? The first one is called, right here, I want you to write it down, called self-employed KEO plans or HR10. I want you to write all that together. Self-employed plan, HR10, KEO plans. These are accounts meant for self-employed people. These are retirement accounts. They're, they're qualified by the IRS. So your money that you're investing um, is tax deductible for your business, but only certain people can get this. You must own 10% of the business. So where it says HR 10, that 10 stands for 10% ownership. You must own 10% of the business to get this, okay? You must be at least 21 years of age to, to own this. You must have one year of service and you must have at least a thousand hours of working per year. So again, who is this plan used for? What's self-employed? Self-employed. Again, I'm gonna go through this again. Self-employed, HR 10 stands for 10% ownership. KEO plans is the exact same word for self-employed plans. You must be over 21 years old, over a thousand hours of working for the year, and you must have one year of service. That's all you need to know about this. In addition to that, the money grows tax deferred. So tax deferred account. So you'll pay money on this when you... And I'm sorry, that's... Well, what was that again? The service? What was it? You must have one year of service, a thousand hours, be over 21 years old, and the money grows 
tax deferred. And it was it should be a thousand hour in a year. Correct. Yeah, I mean, thousand hours. That's nothing. Yeah. Okay. So, simplified employee pension plans. This is the other one you want to write. Simplified employee pension plans. This is meant for smaller employers or your self-employed. In this plan, you can put up to 25% of your income away. This is the big one. When you make good money, you can put up to 25% of your income away. And again, this works just like all the other ones. It goes tax deferred. Works just like that. Normally, a person that gets a SEP or a simplified employee pension plan is someone who doesn't qualify for an IRA. They make too much money. Okay, next one is simple plans. Saving incentives match plans for employees. We're going to keep this very simple. You cannot have no more than 100 employees. You cannot have another qualified plan in place. And the employer has the option to match your account dollar for dollar equal to 3%. And again, the taxation on the money is tax deferred. Okay. The next one, we're going to talk about 401k plans. 401k plans, very simple, guys. It's, a, it's an employer-sponsored plan. Your money is tax deductible in this account. So the money you put into this account is tax deductible from your income. Contributions from your employer, they can match up to a certain amount. Each company is different. There generally are vesting requirements to these accounts. Again, vested requirement means that you need to work there for a certain amount of year to receive 100% of your money that they put away for you or that they matched you. The money grows tax deferred. That is all you need to know about retirement account, 401k plans. This one does talk about profit sharing. Profit sharing plans are qualified accounts where a portion of a company's profits can be shared with employees. If the plan does not define a definite figure of profits to be shared, employers' contributions must be systematic and substantial. Um, profit sharing, is, it's simple. If the company profits, they're gonna share a certain amount of money for the company. Um, generally, profit sharings, those are qualified accounts, so they're gonna work the exact same way. Um, the next one, I want you to write this down, 403B, 403B, tax sheltered annuities, also called TSA. These are the three, they, they, the three separate words, but they all mean the exact same thing. This is the qualified account that is used for nonprofit organizations. This works just like your 401k. The company can match you. So nonprofit organizations, okay? So let me give you the employees that qualify for this, okay? Write these ones down. You wanna write this down. 
the employees that qualify for this account are your teachers, your doctors, your lawyers. I'm sorry, no, no, not lawyers. Teachers, doctors, nurses, your ministers, anybody that works in a field like that. It, it wouldn't be an executive of a business. It's going to be someone that's in that field. 403B, ministers, doctors, nurses, teachers. It works like the 401k does. Tax, tax deductions, tax deferred growth. So I'm going to pay money to pay taxes on it later. That is all you need to know about retirement, qualified retirement accounts. That's all you need to know. You don't need to read any more of this. That's I've given you everything you need to know. So congratulations, guys. We're almost there. So let's see how deep. I, I just want to say, okay, we're almost done with this chapter, y'all. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me. So let's talk about this. Per, personal reasons for life insurance. Who needs life insurance? Why do you need life insurance? Who needs life insurance, guys? So life insurance, personal needs is called survivor protection. So the needs for insurance, who needs insurance? I want you to put life insurance, survivor protection. And then another one is called cash accumulation. So you can use life insurance to build a savings account. You know, we talk about this in whole life policies, right? You are in a position where you can use life insurance needs for cash accumulation. You can also use for liquidity. So when you see the word liquidity, I want you to write next to the whole life insurance, money that can be borrowed from the life insurance policy. So liquidity, money that can be borrowed from the life insurance policy. All right. The next one is estate creation. You would buy life insurance if you don't really have any real assets established. The moment you create, you buy life insurance, you create an immediate estate. Write that down, estate creation. If you have a million dollar life insurance policy and you pass away, guess what? Your family has now created an immediate estate of a million dollars. Which means if you don't have a million dollar life insurance policy, guess what you should have? Get your income up to where you need a million dollars worth of insurance. Estate creation is to create an immediate estate if, God forbid, someone passes away. The next need for life insurance, estate conservation. See, when you pass away, there are taxes that are due on your assets. Did you know that? There's something called the death tax. There's inheritance taxes. You think people got a bunch of um, real estate property? You think they just passed it over to the next person? No. You got to pay them taxes. So life insurance conservation is life insurance proceeds may be used to pay inheritance taxes, federal estate taxes. So it is not necessarily the beneficiary's responsibility to sell off assets. The one thing is you can count on the government will come for their money. They're like Stewie from, from Family Guy when Brian owes him money. You guys haven't seen that. That's a good, good episode. So estate conservation, write that down. That's all you need to know for personal uses of life insurance. Let's talk about the business needs. Why would someone that's in business need life insurance? I think there's only two or three ways. Okay, I'm gonna give them to you, ready? Key person insurance. Y'all heard me talk about this? Key person insurance. This is when the business 
you are so you're such an asset to the company that if God forbid you passed away, they need to replace you. And because you're gone, they're going to lose revenue. And now they got to come out of pocket to train somebody new, find somebody new. So imagine, Tatiana, your company loves you so much and they could not operate without you. They say, hey, you know what? We're going to take a life insurance policy out on Tatiana. And if something happens to you, guess who gets that check? They do. They do. Makes you sound kind of cruel when you're an employee, right? <laughs> like, dang, man, you're going to cash out on my debt? Well, guess what? There, there are actually churches that have policies on their pastors. Because guess what? The pastor's the head of the church. You ain't got nobody else that can preach a good message. Them ties might stop coming in. You need your Sunday motivation, right? Uh, so a business. So let me kind of give you the breakdown of it. So the business is the owner of the policy. The business is the payer of the policy. And the business is the beneficiary of the policy. And again, just like all insurance checks, the company would receive a tax-free check to make that business go. Now, the business cannot take tax deductions for expenses for the premiums paid. So you can't go around saying, hey, listen, this is a tax deduction for your business. It might be a business expense, but it is not a tax deduction for expense of the premium. All right, any questions on that? Okay. The second way you would fund a business, Tatiana, me and you are going into business together today. We're gonna go open up uh, a flower arrangement company because this flower looks pretty cool, even though it's standing right here. We are, we're gonna create flower arrangements. Okay. And you and I are 50-50 partners. I cannot operate my side of the business without you, and you couldn't do the same without me. You and I put an equal amount of money and time into this business, and you say, hey, Miguel, if something happens to you, I still need to be able to run the business. But legally, my partner would be entitled to half of that business. Would you agree? They would because they would still inherit half of the half of the money or half the business. The partner, you mean? Their Correct. spouse? Yes, my spouse. So you if if we're not working with my spouse every day in the business, you don't want them coming in the business and trying to add their own flavor to it, do you? No. No, nah, no, no. So you're gonna do what is called a buy-sell agreement. A buy-sell agreement is a contract that we both sign and we will both write for each other. Hey, I'm gonna buy life insurance on you. You're gonna buy life insurance on me. And if something happens, you're gonna use this money to pay off my family. That you're buying me out. You're buying my family out. Now, do you remember when we talked about that that, that would be what is called insurable interest? Mm -hmm. What? do you think what happened to that policy if god forbid the business dissolved and we kept the policies going and then one some one of them passed away what do you think happens to that policy sorry i was um writing what you were saying if let's just say our business dissolved mm -hmm. but we still have the policy open and then years later one someone passed away who do you think gets that money then? You would. Yeah, you would. You would still get the premium mm -hmm. because you're the one still paying for the premiums. You're still the beneficiary of it. You would get the money. Mm -hmm. Now, there are several types of buy-sell agreements that can be used. I would tell you to come back and read these. These, are, You might see a couple questions on this, but you're not. that's not that big of a deal. Cross-purchasers, cross-purchase, entity purchase, stock purchase stock redemptions. You, you're probably going to see that, but it's not going to be that big of a deal. Okay. Let's talk about tax treatments of insurance premiums, proceeds, and dividends. 
when you buy a life insurance policy on a key person employee, they're not tax deductible. Premiums are not tax deductible. The death benefit that you would receive is tax free. Any money you receive in front of a check from an insurance company, as far as a death policy, a death benefit would be tax free. Okay, so give me a second. Let me find. I'm gonna bypass that right there. Okay, let's go to policy loans. This right here is just a standard definitions, right? Policy loans. The owner may borrow may borrow money from the cash value at any time, as long as they as there's money in there. Okay. Because you're borrowing the money, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Okay. If you borrow money from an insurance policy, you don't have to pay taxes on it. But the insurance company will charge you interest. They will charge you interest and it can be repaid in many ways. So these are the special things you need to know about po policy loans. If you borrow from the policy, you can use the money and they'll charge you interest on it. If you decide to not ever pay that interest, that, that loan back, and then you pass away, they're going to deduct whatever money you owed, plus the interest that all that occurred from the death benefit. How crazy is that? You take out a loan, you're borrowing your own money, but you're paying the insurance company back all that money and then they'll deduct it from your death benefit. Know this, policy loans from cash value are not taxable. So let's talk about surrenders. Surrendering a policy. When a policy owner surrenders a policy, so they're going to cash out the policy and they're going to run. They're, they're going to run. If you have paid in, so if you've earned any interest on the money, so in this example right here, let's just say you bought a $300,000 life insurance policy. You paid in $70,000 in premiums over the policy. And now your cash value is accumulated to a hundred grand. How much interest was earned there? Ellie, how much math is it? Uh, how much interest is earned there? The difference between 70 and a hundred. Uh, from 70 to 130. Yeah. So there was $30,000 of interest that was earned. Because you surrendered that policy, you're now going to own, you're, you're going to owe the difference. You're going to owe taxes on that $30,000 of growth. So that's what happens from a life insurance policy, from if you cash out the policy. Let's talk about accelerated benefits. We talked about this earlier, that if God forbid someone becomes terminally ill, you can get that money advanced to you, and that would be tax-free. Accelerated benefits are paid from chronically Ill, illness policies. Um, so yeah. Trying to look through here and see what's actually gonna be important. Okay, here, let's go back to group life insurance. If a group life insurance policy, they're gonna cover you up to $50,000. They're going to cover you up to $50,000 on the policy. If if they're pay, if they're covering you for more than 50,000, then you're going to owe on that policy. I'm trying to find out where that is on here. 
premium policy loans are not taxable, unlike an individual tax payer. The cash value has a business on the list. This is just standard definitions. I'm trying to bypass it. Okay. The one thing we want to look at is called modified endowment contract. That's a very specific type of policy. Modified endowment contract. It's called a MEC. These policies are, they happen. It's when your life insurance policy, your whole life policy has, <coughs> it has produced very well, meaning the accounts are growing very fast. So in order for it to be a, a MEC, a modified endowment contract, if you overfund this, there's a seven year pay test. So next to MEC, I want you to write fails seven-year pay test. The moment it fails the seven-year pay test, it will now lose some of its tax benefits. That's all you need to know. If you see the word MEC, think of fail seven-year pay test. That's all you need to know on the exam. You're not going to see any more of this. Okay. All right. Last thing we're going to cover, Social Security. Fails seven-year pay test. Yeah, that's all. MEC is all you need. Modified endowment contract. MEC fails seven-year pay test. They're not going to go into too, to too much detail on that. Um, let's talk about Social Security benefits, though. Social Security is named... Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance. Write that down. That is what Social Security was made for. It was made for Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance. So Social Security Disability. You must be fully insured with 40 credit for with 40 quarters. That's for you to be fully insured and partially insured is six credits. So 40 quarters, 40 quarters, you're fully insured. Currently insured is six credits. That's all you need to know. I'm just giving you the bullet points of social security. So, Social Security disability ends at 65. So just write in there, Social Security ends, Social Security disability ends at 65. And Social Security retirement begins at 65. Mm -hmm. So when one ends, another begins. It's not really going to ask you on this test, when does Social Security benefits begin? As far as like what age, you know how you can pull certain limits at certain times? They're not going to ask you that. And then the rest of this is all definitions. You ready to take a quiz? Ready as wherever be? Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Love it. Okay. All of the following would be different between qualified and non-qualified plans, except the difference between qualified and non-qualified. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Except. So let's do process level of eliminations first. Which ones can we get rid of? So all the following are different between them, except so C is right, so we can get rid of that one. Mm -hmm. So taxation on accumulations, taxation on contributions, or taxation on withdrawals. Withdrawals, withdrawals. Oh, withdrawals. So that would be the difference, taxation on withdrawals. Well, let's think about it. qualified accounts, 
there are tax there are tax um, deductions. Um, you're confused. So it's asking the one that says or one that says accept. It's just saying that all the following or you're looking for the wrong answer. That's what I thought. Okay, but I'm not confused. You're looking for the wrong answer. Don't let these things strip you up. These things aren't hard. But we got rid of C. Taxation on accumulation. Um, that is a difference between that because they're accumulated somewhere. Some of the growth is tax free. Some of the tax is tax deferred. And then some of them get taxed every year. If they're non qualified, they don't have any tax benefits. Tax on withdrawals. What do y'all want to go with? Tax deferred. Tax deferred. Not acceptable. Come on, Tati, you choose it. Pressure's on you now. Oh, Lord. I don't know why B is calling me. Okay. Let's go with B. Ooh. Okay, so let's look at it. Taxation on accumulation is deferred in both plans. The rest of the characteristics are different. So the difference between these is taxation on accumulation. I actually stated this wrong earlier. So the way that it's taxed based off of it, because if you take your 401k, that's tax deferred. Non-qualified plans, they're gonna get taxed every year. Okay. All right, so let's go on to, oh, no, I don't wanna exit. Are you sure? Oh, you put the wrong one. You put the wrong one. My bad. My bad. We failed. I failed. Up right here. <laughs> oh, and, well, we have to pass it because I can't move on to the next chapter. Yeah. So, okay, we're forced to do this. If, if taken as a lump sum, life insurance proceeds to beneficiaries are passed, what? This question is only asking if they receive the money from a life insurance check, how is the money taxed? On a lump sum? Um, Doesn't matter how I give you the money, how is the money taxed from insurance? Interest, but tax free and but taxable, tax deductible, free of federal income taxation. Which ones can we get rid of, guys? B. Okay, let's get rid of B. Okay. Okay. You're gonna receive a you're gonna receive a death benefit. Is it taxed? No. Okay. Uh, so is D D. Right, right, right. Don't overthink this, y'all. They're gonna throw all these words in you. If it's taken as a lump sum, life insurance proceeds, or that was just to distract you. It doesn't matter how it's paid out. A life insurance check is always tax free. Unless you take that check and then you would reinvest it into something else. Then you change value, you transfer value of it. That's only when it's taxable. Anytime you get a life insurance check, it's tax free. All right. An employee quits his job on May 15th and does not convert his group life policy to an individual for two weeks. He dies in a freak accident on June 1st. Which of the following statement best describes what will happen? So let's go back to group insurance. What do we talk about? They're covered for how many days? 31. 31 30 days. days. So what do you think would happen? He's still covered. Yes, he will receive yeah. the money. The family will receive the money. They're going to receive how much money? We're going to, what answer are we the going full, with? The full death benefit. The full. Wonderful. See? Good, good. You see, once we know what this stuff is, we can just know what group insurance is. So we're gonna freaking cut all the bull crap, no matter what type of scenario they give us, we're gonna cut this thing up. 
All right, which of the following is the best reason to purchase life insurance rather than annuity? So let's go back to the personal uses of insurance. Annuities are meant to help you outlive, not outlive your money. Insurance is to make sure your family doesn't, God forbid, suffer financially if you pass too soon. Is a C? Absolutely, great job. Great job. All the following would be eligible to establish a Keo plan, except go back to your notes. Isn't that the um, self-employment? Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So who can have this except who cannot have this? Uh president. Okay, so we want to go B. Let's let's go with that. Mm -hmm. Good job. Go with your first gut answer. Great job, Tati. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Which of the following is an IRS qualified retirement account? About, you know, whatever. Retirement program. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. We should follow is an IRS self employee. Self employees B. Which one? B. Correct. Let's look at it. Did you ever see the word split dollar? Split dollar. Get that you. crap out. This stuff ain't in your notes. If it ain't in your notes, mm -hmm. don't worry about it on this exam. Buy sell agreement. Did that have to do with retirement accounts? Mm -hmm. Life insurance. 401k plans, big employers, self-employed, mm -hmm. good job. All right, Social Security was created to provide all of the following benefits except. What was Social Security? Disability. It was for old age survivors with disability. Okay, so let's do process of elimination. Which one was it made for? Which one was it not made for? This one's asking employment. It was, it was made for disability retirement. Mm -hmm. Jade said unemployment. Unemployment. B, please. A bunch of people on unemployment right now be happy about that. Hey, let me get some of that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Partners in a business enter a buy sell agreement to purchase a life, uh, enter a buy sell agreement to purchase life insurance, which states that should one of them die prematurely, the other one would be financially stable in the interest of the deceased partner. What type of insurance policy may be used to fund this agreement? Buy sell agreement. Remember, buy is sell agreement is nothing but a contract. Which one? Is a C? Remember, buy sell agreement is nothing but a contract. Yes. You're, you're, you're funding it with life insurance. This is asking you what kind of policy would you use to fund it? So, any? Any? Absolutely. Great job. Do not let this confuse you. Well, I promise you, once you read this and you listen to this, you're going to be freaking like a ninja. It's like, all of the following benefits are available to Social Security or under Social Security, except welfare benefits. Well, <laughs> see, wonderful guys. All right, when an employee terminates coverage under a group life policy, group life insurance policy, coverage continues in force for sixty days. Is that what it was? Or coverage. Coverage is uh, for how many eight. more days? 31. It's 31 days. Okay. When an employee, not employer, I don't know if I said if I read employee, employer. When an employee terminates coverage, policy will continue to win. When an employee terminates coverage, the employee coverage condition. Don't overthink this. The employee yeah. said, hey, I don't want the coverage no more. How long is it enforced though?
I still say it's 31 days. Okay. Good job. Good job. Good job. All right. What is the purpose of keep person insurance? If you're on my team, you dad gonna better know this one. I've been talking about this for a while. The B? Let's read through these again. C. Huh? C? Yeah, I think C. Okay. Yes. Remember, if you're taking insurance out on the key person. They are so important that you would lose you would lose money financially if they passed away, and you got to use that money to replace them or to hire and train somebody new. If an immediate annuity is purchased with the face amount at debt with the face amount at death or cash value as surrendered, this would be considered what. So remember, we talked about immediate annuity. That's just a, you put a lot, you put some money up front. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be a rollover because you're not taking it from one qualified account. You're taking it from life insurance to an annuity. Mm -hmm. Get rid of A and D, correct, yes. Okay. Same taxable exchange. So, Remember how I said, what would be a taxable, when would life insurance be taxable? Is when it exchanges value. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's, it's either gonna be C or B. I, I'm gonna go with, with B. I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, we'll blame it on me. Okay. No, all right, I want my first gut. Settlement option is exercised with an immediate annuity purchased with a face amount at death or cash value at surrender. All right, the minimum number amounts for partially created social security. I just gave you this one. Yeah. That was 10? Six. Six. Is six credits for partial? Yes. What Remember, like four? I told you, I said, I'm gonna give you just what you need to know to pass this stuff. We don't need all the other bull crap. In order to qualify for conversion from a group life policy that has been terminated from an individual of the same coverage, a person must have been insured under the plan for how many years? We talked about this. Group insurance covered for how many years? Five. Five. Great job. Write that down. If you don't have that, write that down right now. Mm -hmm. If the master contract is terminated, every individual who has been on the plan for at least five years will be allowed to convert to an individual policy of the same coverage. And what type of coverage is that gonna be though? What type of policy? Would it be the whole life? Correct, correct, whole life. All of the following employees may be used, may use a 403B for their retirement plan except. So which of these? employees could use this which one can except, except. Huh. remember who, who uses these like the teachers doctors the teachers, doctors yeah. nurses and ministers which one cannot use it the vice president the Hmm. That's Sarah Morgan, the CEO. Yeah. You cannot use it. The CEO of a private corporation. So you Does it have to be like the employees within? Yeah. Oh. All right. Uh, traditional IRA contributions are tax deductible based on which of the following? The owner's age, IRA limits, owner's income, 
or how long the plan has been in force. D. Okay, you think D, what do you think Ellie? Attacks, attacks. The doctor has to make sure the plan. C. Okay, so we got C and D. Mm. Ellie, what do you think? Earned income under 50 years, 65. Come on, last question, guys. D. So we got C, D. Is that right? Yeah. Who says C? I might be confused. This is for the one thing I was looking at. Let's go D. Income. Owner's income. All right. So, owner's income. Remember, you can only make, make a certain amount of money in order to qualify for one of these. Um, hey Siri, what is the IRA contribution income limits? Okay, I found this on the web for what is the- Let's find out what is the income limit a person has to can make. So it's 6,500 again for anyone that's under 50 and it's 7,500 if you're over 50 is the contribution limits. What is the income limit? IRA, this is saying changes, IRA income almost to those guys. Okay, so if you make 138,000 single, you that's when it, the cutout for the IRA is, is 220, 218,000 if you file jointly as a married couple. Hmm. All right, so we have a 93% passing rate, guys. So great job to everyone on here. We are now getting ready for chapter five. Open this hole. Let's go. Mm -hmm. People are going to be like, so chapter five, who regulates insurance? Uh, okay, this one tomorrow. Looks like we're, this one's gonna be a short a short one tomorrow, guys. So we'll be able to run through this one very fast. And then chapter five, that's a good song, chapter five album by Trey Songz. Uh, that is good. So good to go, guys. We are good to go, ladies. We are getting one step closer to being finalized. We're ready to pass this exam and good job. We're almost there.